I'm going to wait for a signal from our cameraman if, when we're live. You want to give me that? We're good. Okay. Well, welcome to the College Place Village Seventh day Adventist Church. I'm so glad that you are here. Um, I'm Dr. Stephen Reeser, also known as Pastor Steve here. I'm one of the associates here. Um, but this weekend, I'm Dr. Steve. I'm presenting uh, two lectures and a sermon. So tonight will be something of a sort of a sermon, sort of a lecture. And tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock, I hope you'll come back again for part three of the three-part series. And at the end of tonight's presentation and at the end of tomorrow afternoon's presentation, after the live stream is done and we're officially finished, I'm going to stay after for a Q&A session. So if anybody would like to stay after and, and grill me, uh, uh, so we're gonna, we'll move quickly through some things tonight, but if you have questions, uh, just write yourself a note and I'll be very happy to answer them after, afterwards. I have up with me um, a very lovely looking group of young people from our church here. They're going to help uh, lead in our theme song for this series. It's a song called Ancient Words, written by Lynn DeShazo, and I think it just uh, hits the nail on the head for what we're going to be talking about. So thank you, young people, for being with us here. And I'd like to invite all of you to sing along. Uh, if you don't know it, you can start singing when you, when you figure it out. It's a pretty simple song, right? <laughs> Father, we ask that your ancient words will impart tonight to us uh, encouragement, wisdom, guidance as we face uh, a, an uncertain future in this world and a certain future in the world to come. We praise in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. Are you leaving there?
Our presentation tonight, Forged in Fire, Burning Still. I'm beginning this series with an assertion. It's an assertion I think we can all agree with. We are living in dark and difficult times. But just in case you disagree, let's cast our gaze across planet Earth tonight and see what we find. Even while the light of the gospel continues to penetrate to unreached areas around the globe, to, to people groups, to the work of missionaries and mission societies like the Avenist Development and Relief Agency, Avenist Frontier Missions, Gospel Outreach, Avenist World Radio, and a host of other worthy, worthy organizations. In the midst of that light being spread, we also see a growing ignorance of God and His Word in the West. Christians are now minorities in a lot of so-called Christian countries, like England, where only 47% of the population is now Christian, and the Netherlands, which only, with only 41% being Christian in that country. Christians still make up a narrow majority in Canada, where I've just come from, with 53% of the population, but nearly a third of Canadians consider themselves to be agnostic or atheist or non-religious. And I expect that Christians will probably be a minority in that beautiful country in the next census. And here in America, 65% of the population of America claims to be Christian. They say we are Christian, but only 20% of the population believe the Bible is the Word of God. That means that only one in three Christians in America believe that the Bible is inspired and that when you read the Bible, God speaks and still guides and directs His people. Less than one in three. These are dark days when people who say they follow Jesus hide the light of His word, dark days. The days grow dark when, on the one hand, some celebrities are celebrated as they display satanic themes in their performances, and then other celebrities are canceled because they defend their own Christianity. The days grow dark when objective truth is called evil and fascist, and a wave of neo-Marxism with its rabid anti-Christian agenda infests our schools and our media. The days grow dark when the ongoing sexual revolution that began back in the 1960s, when it sets its sights on our kids through social media, mainstream media, through influencers, celebrities, and teachers who tell kids, do whatever you want. You can be whatever you want can even change your gender, and then demand the state to allow them to against their parents' wishes. The days grow dark when Christians, in the face of this, clamor for more political power in order to save the nation, thinking that a political party is their salvation. The days grow dark when Isaiah's words ring true. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. They're dark days. And these are, these are difficult days to live in. It's difficult to know what the future's gonna hold. It's hard to navigate a rapidly changing world. In fact, it's impossible to believe your own eyes sometimes. There are exploding conflicts in Europe and Asia and Africa and the Middle East. There, there's been more talk of World War III in the last 18 months than since, than since the, the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s, and most of you guys can remember that. What's going on? There were the difficult days during the uh, global pandemic that created such anger and division around the world, but even inside the church. There are online platforms that foster conspiracy theories, and the problem is some of them are true. 
course, some of them aren't, but how, how do we know? How do we know? There are difficult days when in the midst of the pandemic, the U.S. government quietly confirmed ongoing interactions with, with what they call UAPs. The rest of us call them UFOs. Very, you, guys, you guys recognize that. Very quietly, yeah, UFOs exist. Which normalized a growing expectation of alien contact. Huh, I wonder where that's leading. There's an acceleration of advancements in technology, including the threat of AI, artificial intelligence, which creates photorealistic pictures. Those aren't actually people. That's just AI creating an image. Can you believe your eyes anymore? There's been one unprecedented natural disaster after another, and this keeps the threat of climate change constantly in the news cycle. There's runaway inflation that squeezes family budgets and drags more people into poverty. There are difficult days when with every crisis, powerful and power-hungry people seek greater control of governments and resources and people. We are living in dark and difficult times. But this is nothing new. Our time is very much like many times in the past. Times of warfare and disease and uncertainty and disaster. It was in times just like our times that God inspired the Word of God, the Bible. The Bible forged in, in fire and storm and blood over the course of 16 centuries, written by numerous authors, some we know, some we don't spoken in a specific context, and yet still speaking today to every language and region and culture and person. So tonight, I want to take us through a journey of seven eras in which the Bible was written. We're going to see how those things in those eras bear a striking resemblance to the world that we live in today which will comfort us that as God spoke in those times, his word still speaks to our time as well. So our seven eras, uh, I'll just list them quickly and then we'll look at each one uh, individually. There is the era of the exodus and the conquest of the promised land. That was around, by the way, the dates I have on here are big targets, big targets, big broad targets. I'm, uh, specifics can be very difficult when dating uh, ancient events. Anyway, somewhere between 1500 and 1100 BC, there was an era of exodus and conquest of the Promised Land. So Israel left Egypt and moved into uh, Palestine, the Levant. Uh, the next one is the United Kingdom uh, under the first kings. That only lasted for 100 years, from 1100 to 1000 BC, and then that kingdom divided. And for the next 400 years, between 1000 BC and 600 BC, uh, there, was, there was Israel in the north and Judah in the south, two separate nations. And then around between 600 and 500 BC, there was an era of exile when both Israel and Judah were displaced. And in the following years, 500 to 300 BC, there was a return. Between 300 and 100, there was an era of translation, we'll talk about that, uh, and Apocrypha, um, and then finally the New Testament era as we move from B.C. to A.D. So the crises that the Bible writers faced in each of their eras have points of commonality with the crises that we face today, and that's, uh, with the, that's what we want to look for tonight. So our first era is the era of Exodus. The era of Exodus. During the era of Exodus, the Pentateuch was written. The Pentateuch, that's the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. At least the majority portions of it at least were written and or compiled by Moses during that era, as well as the book of Joshua. The first crisis that Israel faced is a crisis of national survival. 
as they exit Egypt with the Egyptians threatening to destroy them, as they, as they move through the wilderness with other nations uh, like the Amalekites threatening them, as they move into uh, the, the promised land and the Canaanites there uh, threatening them, they are constantly under threat as a nation. During this era, they are trying to order their society from from being uh, an oppressed group of slaves to being a free people who are in covenant with God. How do you become a covenant community, a covenant nation? What does that look like? There was, there was no precedent. No nation on earth had ever had a covenant with their God before. And so it was difficult for the Israelites to figure out what, what does that even mean? What does that look like? They struggled with idolatry and paganism. They struggled because that's what they knew. That's what the nations around them did. This crisis of nation building and covenant faithfulness reaches its climax as they move into the promised land and they fail to stick together. The 12 tribes don't bond. They don't work together. They start fighting. and In fact, they come to a point where they almost completely wipe out the tribe of Benjamin. During this time, there is rampant immorality. Things are not good for the children of Israel. In the time of the judges, we read horrible stories. Maybe the worst is the story about the Levite's concubine. If you don't know that story, um, look it up and or ask a parent maybe later. But even the judges themselves, like Samson and Gideon, have dubious morality. And this is is a comfort to us. This should encourage us that in this first era of Bible writing, they didn't look all that much different than, well, than our world looks today. American society is is fraction, fractured and, and factional in, in a way that's uh, almost unprecedented since probably the times of the Civil War. Morality is subjective. That means everybody gets to decide what is right for themselves. There's no objective standard for what is right or wrong. Christianity itself is fractured and denominational. We don't get along well with each other at all. We're sort of like the children of Israel and their tribes. And worse, though morality is subjective in our society, even within Christianity, immorality is celebrated. Things that God says don't do. There are Christians that say it's good to do that. And so the Bible that was written in that era speaks to our era today. And I'm just going to read a couple of excerpts from that portion of Scripture. From Judges 21-25, we read, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Sounds like our world. And the response, the solution, we find in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 6-4-9, it begins with something called the Shema. The Shema, it's the, it's the key text of Hebrew Scripture. The most important, in fact, when when they asked Jesus, what's the most important part of the Bible? This is what he said. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk them of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. What else do we need than that? To turn our hearts and love God more than anything else and be faithful to Him in a in a world that is subjective, subjective, sorry, subjective and uncertain. We can turn our hearts to to God. Let's move now to the second 
period, the second era where the Bible was written. In the, in the next era, uh, the, the era of the United Kingdom, in this very short era, uh, we have uh, a few history books that are collected and written that support the monarchy. We have wisdom literature as well uh, that's produced. Um, so we uh, go to the next slide here. There's the, the book of Judges and Ruth. Um, the book of Judges is uh, actually an appeal for the monarchy. Um, the book of Ruth describes uh, the familial setting of the second king of Israel, David. Uh, we have Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Um, I've put Job in there. Job probably was not written during this era. Job is a very old, very old book, but I don't know where else to put it. Um, and then there's, of course, uh, the book of Samuel that describes what's happening here. And in this, in this time, once, once Samuel um, has crowned the kings, uh, the kings are able to uh, address the, the most significant threat of the era, and that's the Philistines. All throughout this era, the Philistines loom large. Of course, we know a famous Philistine from Gath named Goliath because he's in a very favorite story of ours with a young guy named David. The Philistines are, are sea peoples. They are a, a tribe of uh, people who've, who've come from uh, eastern Italy and western Greece, and they've settled. And their invasion into the Levant, the area that Palestine is in, uh, marks the end of the Bronze Age because they bring iron weapons. It's a significant threat to Israel who do not have iron weapons. During this time, there is a kingmaker, the last judge, a guy by the name of Samuel. He rises up, he, he anoints the first two kings of Israel, Saul and David, and introduces an era of kings, but also an era of peace and prosperity. David brings the peace, and Solomon brings the prosperity. The writings of this period are, are uniquely artistic and beautiful, because Israel is finally at rest. And a nation at rest produces art. Under the leadership of Solomon, there is, uh, there is great, great wealth, abundant wealth. So much so that silver in the days of Solomon was counted as nothing. It was worthless because there was just so much of it. And there's some points of commonality with our day today from the time of the United Kingdom commonality. Boy, we live in a world of wealth and ease and luxury like even Solomon couldn't imagine. With vehicles to drive us around and technology to let us communicate. I mean, there's people watching from, from all over the place tonight because technology. Wow. We have access to things other people could have only dreamed of. But there is a despair that comes with overabundance and ease of life. There's a despair. There's a, there is an anxiety that has arisen in our society. Stress, depression, discontentment, a fixation on, on finding enjoyment and being happy, a fixation that leads to sex and drugs, and entertainment, and that threatens our society with suicide. It's unimaginable that in the midst of plenty, people despair of life. And yet Solomon experienced this very, very thing. In Ecclesiastes, he launches into his sermon. He says, uh, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is van I've tried everything in the world and nothing brought me peace. The more I have, the worse I feel. In fact, he says, I said to my, in my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. But surely this also was vanity. 
people of that age realized what the people of our age need to realize, and that is you'll never find happiness by seeking happiness. Never will. Solomon would tell you, you find happiness by seeking God and his righteousness. From the days of Solomon and immediately following Solomon's death, we move from a united kingdom into an era of divided kingdom. This is a much longer era now. The era of divided kingdom. This is where, as I said, uh, the northern tribes, ten tribes, uh, severed their relationship with David's uh, line and became known as the tribe of Israel or the nation of Israel. And Judah and Benjamin uh, remained together to form the state of Judah. Um, during this time, uh, there is the rise of what we call the classical prophets, all right? So there's been prophets all along. Moses is a prophet. Samuel is, um, uh, we've got Elijah and Elisha. We've got some great prophets early on. But during this time, there's also a rise of what are called classical prophets. They're prophets that write, wrote, their, wrote their prophecies down, and we have those books still today. So during the time of the divided kingdom, we have, um, some Israel-based prophets, okay, Israel-based, they're focused on Israel. That's Jonah and Amos and Hosea. We have some Judah-based and Judah-focused uh, uh, prophets, and I realize there is an H missing at the end of that Judah. I thought I'd point it out before you noticed it. Uh, there's Joel, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk. Uh, these are uh, prophesying and ministering to, to the nation of Judah. During this time of divided kingdom, there is a near constant threat of war from enemies all around them and even from each other. You'd think that Israel and Judah would get along. They did not. They were fighting each other as much as anybody else. During this time, idolatry is, continues to be a, uh, uh, a huge problem. I mean, it, the northern tribes are idolatrous the entire time. The whole time they worship idols. Judah fluctuates, they, they vacillate back and forth uh, between worshiping God, Yahweh God, and worshiping other gods. And so these latter prophets, these classical prophets, herald warnings, and the warnings are based on the terms of the covenant. That covenant that was made in the first era at Sinai, they come now to the descendants of those who made the covenant and say, listen, you are a covenant people. And if you're not faithful to the covenant, the covenant curses will be meted out. And prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. And if you read through the prophets, you're like, how many times do they have to say this before these people understand? Well, they never would understand. Not just by hearing the warning. There's some commonality. The big commonality I see between that era and ours is gross ignorance of the covenant. Now, of course, we are part of a new covenant, but there's gross ignorance within Christianity today about the covenant that God has made with us through Jesus Christ. I just don't hear Christians talking about their covenant relationship with God. Ignorance. I want to read a little bit longer of a, of a text here, but I want to read something that gives me encouragement and hope that the, we, haven't, we haven't lost the paperwork, but it's been lost in practice. Hope that it will be found, this, this idea of faithfulness to God's covenant. Uh, we read in, uh, in, I think it's the next slide here, yeah, in the, in the book of 2 Kings, we read about this, this moment that takes place. Um, Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Now, this is, it's like, look, I can't believe what I found because in their generation, no one, no one had seen it. They thought it was lost. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Hilkiah gave the book to, oh, and I, that twice. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, 
Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. I found a book. Look at this. And Shaphan read it before the king. When the king heard the words, the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahiakim the son of Shaphan, and Achbar the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the secretary, and Asiah the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that was written concerning us. I have great hope. Great hope. That Christians will rediscover the truths of Scripture and recommit themselves to the covenant that Jesus made with us. Well, the people in uh, the time of uh, the divided kingdom didn't heed the warnings. Sometimes they would for a bit, but they, they, they ignored the warnings, and finally the things that had been warned about had to come true. And we move from the time of the divided kingdom we into the era of exile. The era of exile from 600 to 500, there's a, it's, a little, it's a little more than 100 years, but it's about there. This era of exile is an era in which the, 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 the danger that loomed finally arrived. Of course, there are continued prophets uh, during this era. Of course, the, prophet, the, the prophetic books that we have uh, 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 still are all re relative to Judah and Babylon. That's because when Israel was taken by the Assyrians into captivity, uh, almost everything was lost of Israel. Very little came back. But in Babylon, we have some prophets. We have Ezekiel, and we have Daniel, and we have Obadiah, who are, who are ministering and prophesying. There are historical books and records that are collected and put together. Uh, the book of Samuel and the book of Kings uh, they're cut in half now, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, but they're, you know, each in an individual unit. Um, so, so the, the threat of annihilation has resulted in exile. Okay, Israel, like I said, is in Assyria, and Judah is in Babylon. And in exile, they've lost their cities, their homes, their land, they've lost their temple, they've lost everything. And in the midst of having lost it all, the amazing thing is that the people of Judah find a new commitment to God. They have a sharpened eschatological expectation. The prophets Ezekiel and Daniel sure help with that. They are now, they are now focused on what God is going to do in the future. They are faithful to the covenant. They have finally gotten rid of something called henotheism. Um, henotheism is where uh, you, you, you serve one god, but you believe that the, all the other gods still exist. Um, and that's what Israel and Judah really wrestled with. Is they say, we'll, well, we'll serve Yahweh. Okay, we'll serve Yahweh. But Baal's out there. And as long as we believe Baal exists, it's going to be a temptation to worship Baal as well. Hedge our bets. Worship them both. Okay. But during the exile the Jews become monotheists, fully committed only to Yahweh, their God. Some interesting points of commonality with our world. It sure is interesting to see that in places where it is hardest to be the Christian, where it's most difficult to be a Christian, the faith of Christians burns the brightest. I think that's what the exile teaches us. Sometimes, sometimes though we don't want it to happen, sometimes the bad thing has to happen in order for God to get us where he needs us. And so in a difficult world with all types of disasters seeming to loom over us, multiple disasters on the horizon, we, like Daniel, have opportunity for 
repentance. I want to I read part of Daniel's prayer of repentance here. And I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made confession, and said, O oh Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. So there in exile, having lost everything, they find the one thing that they had struggled to, to, uh, to uh, solidify in their national identity. So the good news is, around 500 BC, there is opportunity for return. From 500 to 300, we have this. We have a. We have waves of uh, Israelites returning to the land of Judah. The, in this era, we have the final prophetic ministry. The final prophets uh, do their work, and we have a collection of ancient records and uh, uh, a tabulation of history. So we have the prophets uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Um, Chronicles, you guys know that like 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings covers like a certain period of history, and then Chronicles is like same, similar period, sort of same, sort of different. Um, that's because they were actually, com they were compo uh compiled and edited in different eras. Um, and it's during the return here that, uh, the cr that Chronicles is, is compiled. Um, the Pentateuch is, like, so the books of Moses had been lost, forgotten, they were refound during the exile, they are held on to, and it's when the return happens that they are compiled together. Um, likely there's a little bit of editing that takes place and arranging of things, and then uh, they are never lost again. Praise God. Uh, and then we have the narratives of Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther that, uh, that tell us some history of that, of that uh, time. When they lay the foundation for the temple, there's this great shout of jubilation and mingled with the shout of jubilation because the temple is going to be rebuilt. Mingled with that shout of jubilation are the are the people with the gray hairs who are old enough to have remembered the first temple, Solomon's temple. And they are weeping while everyone else is rejoicing because the second temple in its initial iteration is, is, a, is, is nothing compared to the splendor of Solomon's temple. But whereas Israel was never faithful to God for very long, in the days of the first temple. They are committed to a faithfulness to God in the era of the second temple. Uh, and that makes up for that, that loss. And of course, by the time of the New Testament, there will be a glory in the second temple that was never in the first. That's because Jesus, God in flesh, will walk its hallways. Um, as they rebuild the temple and as they rebuild Jerusalem, uh, they they face a significant threat from their neighbors and from their relatives. Okay, this is where we are introduced to the Samaritans. Uh, the Samaritans are Jew of Jewish descent. They're the ones who got left behind when everyone else was sent to, to Babylon and to Assyria. They got left behind. And they did, they, they survived the best they could, but they abandoned the worship of Yahweh and turned to idolatry. And so when the Israelites came back, they said, hey, we want to help you build your temple. But they were, they were idolaters. They were pagans. They had mingled the worship of Yahweh with the worship of other things, and the Israelites said no. And now they did what they could to stop the temple from being built. There are some points of commonality in our era as well. Sometimes the people that are more similar to us that oppose us the most. And there are Christians who have abandoned the terms of the new covenant, have abandoned a sense of faithfulness to God, to God's law, to the teachings of Jesus. They've abandoned the Bible as the rule of faith and practice. 
And they are the most vocal opponents of Christians who are faithful to all of those. Faithful to the covenant, faithful to Jesus, and faithful to the teachings of the Bible. Ezra records uh, how God works on behalf of his people when they are troubled. So just a two excerpts from the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 4. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus king of, sorry, Cyrus king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius king of Persia. So this is the, the problem. And so they, um, they sent letters, the, the leaders in Jerusalem sent letters and asked for help. And King Cyrus responded to the complaints from the local governors after reading the history of what was going on. And King Cyrus says this, this is great. Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God on its site. Moreover, I issue a decree as to what you shall do for the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God. Let the cost be paid at the king's expense from taxes on the region beyond the river. This is to be given immediately to these men so that they are not hindered. If you want to hurt someone, you go after their pocketbook. And that's what Cyrus did. He said, not only do you need to stop getting in their way, uh, those tax dollars that you covet so much, hand them over. Uh, there's nothing like, there's nothing like uh, tax money to, to really teach a lesson. So we, we, we see a successful return from exile. We see the temple rebuilt. We see Jerusalem rebuilt. And that should inspire us with confidence that the church of the 21st century is not without, uh, without God's means to help successfully carry his work on. After the return, there is a period. There's a period when uh, the, there are no more prophets. So God doesn't raise up new prophets. Um, uh, we call it sometimes the intertestamental period, but I'm calling it something different. It's actually the period of translation and apocrypha. Uh, this period of translation uh, goes, begins around 300 and lasts till around 100. And again, like I said, these are very vague, broad dates. Don't try to pin me down on them. Um, it, it is uh, two, two very important things happen, and I'm actually going to talk more about this tomorrow afternoon. Just a little advertisement. Tomorrow afternoon, 3 o'clock, we're going to dig a little deeper into this era to explain uh, why it's an, a very important era. era. Um, so there is a significant translation that takes place during this period. That translation is called the Septuagint. It's sometimes abbreviated as LXX. The, the Hebrew Bible... The old, what we call the Old Testament, but the Hebrew Bible is translated into Greek. This is a big deal. You'll find out tomorrow why. The other thing that happens with that translation, there are some additions of some texts that are only in Greek. There's no Hebrew version of these that get added in. Um, and it's something we call the Apocrypha. Um, Protestants don't consider it to be Scripture. Uh, there is no... There are no prophetic books as part of this. Um, there are some additions to the book of Daniel, um, but they are late and clearly not original. Uh, there's some very interesting history, though, that is explained, uh, it, uh, that helps us understand uh, what's happening in, in the New Testament um, if we read it, but we don't consider it to be Scripture. After... Uh, af so there's then about 150 years where there's no translation taking place, there's no new books being added, there's nothing, there's, it's a, it is a time, not that nothing is happening in the world, but it's a, a blank time in the creation of the Bible until we get to about 50 A.D. And in 50 A.D. we begin the New Testament era. Of course, we know that Jesus was, was born and grew up and ministered and, uh, and taught and was killed and resurrected and went back to heaven uh, before A.D. 50, right? The, but, but the writing of the Bible begins somewhere around 50 A.D. 
and and I'll, let's we'll look at a rough outline of the order of the books that were written in the New Testament. Okay, it's not the order that the that they're arranged in the Bible now, right? The there were early epistles. The early epistles, James and Jude. Um, both of them are brothers of Jesus, and they're the first epistles that we have that, that were collected as Scripture. Um, next, we have the early epistles of Paul. So after the, the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, following that, Paul launches into his ministry, and in the early days, he produces a number of, of uh, letters that he writes to various churches. There's First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Romans, Colossians, Philemon. These are earlier letters of Paul. After Paul has written his letters, uh, so quite a few letters are written first before Matthew and Mark and Luke decide to sit down and write down the, the, the contents of, the, the, of their Gospels. Up to that point, they were preaching the Gospel. People knew these stories, but they hadn't been written down yet. Um, and so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, uh, they write theirs. Of course, Luke is, is a two-part. There's Luke 1 and Luke 2. We call it Luke and Acts, right? A two-part volume there that, that Dr. Luke writes. Uh, sometime after that, there are the later Pauline epistles. So Philippians, Ephesians, First and Second Timothy, Titus. Um, I have Hebrews there with an asterisk, and I, we, we can talk about it in the Q&A. We can talk about it in the Q&A of where does Hebrews fit into all of this. Um, uh, following that then, um, there are the final epistles, First and Second Peter, First, Second, and Third John, and then of course John and Revelation. Um, which so the Gospel of John is written very late, well after the other three Gospels are written, um, probably before the Book of Revelation. It's highly likely the Rev Revelation is the very last book written by John. Well, the New Testament era faced challenges from inside the church and outside the church. There are, as we read the letters that, that, uh, that describe, uh, help us to understand the condition of the first century church, we read about a church that is just an absolute mess. The people are struggling to figure out how to be followers of Jesus, maybe, you know, like we are today. To be a Christian in that era was a thing of shame. Their society was built on honor and shame. You would do anything for honor, and you would do anything to avoid shame. And to, ta and to be called a Christian, to take the name Jesus, meant that everybody you associated with looked at you with shame. Can't believe you've done that. The first century world is a pluralistic world. That means every region has their own gods, their own belief systems, their own way of doing things. Um, there are... Uh, uh, there's an expectation that you will embrace, wherever you're at, you will embrace what they do there and uh, live that way. And because of that, people who believe that the gospel is true and people who do not believe the gospel of, is true, there is a dividing line. There, it's, it's very difficult um, to even associate between the two. Um, Christians are ostracized. Christians are, um, are eventually persecuted. And of course, in this, so those, those are exterior threats, there is still the interior threat, the great looming threat that, that the apostles speak about, the great looming th threat of a falling away. That, that the, pe the believers themselves will stop following the teaching of the apostles, will stop following the religion of Jesus. And the final threat, of course, is the threat of Rome. Uh, the power of Rome is, uh, for everybody in that era, is absolute. So there's some commonality between the first century and the 21st century. There are some similarities. The world we live in and the world that the New Testament writers lived in. The first one is that modern Christians, that's us, we're a mess too. 
we, we're still making the same kind of mistakes that they were making in the first century. You know, we look back at the prophets as they prophesied to Israel, like, when would they ever figure out? And here we are, 20 centuries later, still struggling with the same stuff that Paul and Peter and James write about. There is, there is a culture of honor and shame in our world today as well. It has become more prevalent as we've moved online because people that you don't even know can now say horrible things about you, try to get you fired, or shame you in other ways. We, l we have moved through a postmodern era, postmodernism, which denies absolute truth. There's a, there's a sense um, that an appeal to, to truth is no longer credible because I can have my truth. You can have your truth. They're equally valid. And with that, the postmodern world has rejected the historicity of Jesus' life and death, just like the ancient world did. The ancient world said, Jesus was not resurrected. That's impossible. That's what they still say today. We've moved past the postmodern world, and this might be news to you. We're post-postmodern now. We're in the metamodern world is the term that uh, uh, generalationists uh, are embracing now. The post, sorry, the metamodern world now does embrace religion. Well, religions, even Christianity. Postmodernists will take an element from here, an element from there, and an element from there, and they will put it together an eclectic personal b belief system and system of practice. They will say they are spiritual, but not religious. So they will see things that you say, hey, listen, this is, this is why it's so great to be a Christian. They'll be like, you're right. I'm going to adopt those things. I'm not going to believe in Jesus, but I'm, I want the benefits without any of the responsibilities. And yet in the midst of all this, it is still true that true Christians are solely faithful to Jesus and the teachings of the Bible. So what does Jesus say about this in John 14, 6? Jesus makes a very exclusive claim. He rejects the idea that you can pick and choose, and whatever you choose is equally fine. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Me, says Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through me. It is an exclusive claim. But of course, it's also a very inclusive claim as well because he says everybody's invited, but you have to come to me. There is a sense of calling out in the first century, of saying, this, I, we know this is what society is like, but we want to invite you to come out of that. So Paul to the Corinthians says this, he says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Like, you need to come out of that. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor, or, yeah, covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. He casts a pretty broad net there, doesn't he? But again, look at how inclusive the kingdom of God is. And such were some of you. The 21st century church should be made up of people with dubious backgrounds and questionable histories. Because that's what the first century church was made up of. Look at the problems out there. And the first century church invited people to something better, but did not exclude those because they came from somewhere worse. There was no amount of shaming, no cancel culture that could stop the apostles. Paul writes to the Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, also for the Greek. He said, no matter how you shame me, oh, you Christians, you are, you are bigots, and you are hypocrites, and you are hateful people. Shame on you. 
No amount of shame. Paul says, I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm going to keep preaching Jesus because he is the power of salvation. These are dark days and these are difficult times. But they're not unexpected. They're not catching God by surprise. I want to end with one verse, one final verse here from the New Testament era. We get to the end of the New Testament, to the book of Revelation. Jesus is waiting for us there. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. In every era, the dark and difficult days were lit with the light of God's word. A light that still shines and grows only brighter when the days grow dark. May we turn our hearts to God's word in every perplexity we face in our world. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you led the prophets of old and the writers of the Bible to to put down into their context, your word, so that we have a trustworthy guide in our world today. We want to commit ourselves tonight, Jesus, to to study of the word, to, to turn to it in moments of perplexity and pain and sorrow. And as we do, we pray that you will faithfully speak to us through your spirit as we open your word. Praise in your name. Amen. All right, that's the conclusion.